conversation today is all about heart health, and we'll be hitting on a whole bunch of topics as they're related to cardiovascular disease, including the role of exercise in heart health, and can too much exercise potentially do more harm than good? We'll spend a bit of time discussing the heart healthy diet. Sometimes that can lead to confusion because our advice as healthcare providers seems to fluctuate every so often. Of course, no conversation about heart health would be complete without some discussion about important risk factors including some discussion about the impact of genetics versus lifestyle. We'll also talk about uh, the different types of diagnostic and screening tests that are available and why some may be better for certain people than others. And we'll also spend some time discussing the various medications that are available for preventing and treating cardiovascular disease. Barry and Deanna, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. Our pleasure. Absolutely. So this is something I've really wanted to talk about for a very long time. And I'm excited to get after it with both of you here. So lots and lots of ground to cover in terms of this topic. It's a huge topic. So what I'm going to try to do is kind of flow through this in, a, in the most logical sort of way I can so we can cover the whole field in a relatively short amount of time. First off, I want to talk about cardiac disease and risk factors. Many people out there are familiar with the common ones, the big ones. So we'll start with an easy one. So we've got smoking and we've got high blood pressure and high cholesterol and diabetes and obesity. So let's start there just to get our feet wet. Let's talk about smoking. Barry, how bad is smoking and secondhand smoke exposure for your heart? The literature clearly suggests that lifelong smokers lose 10 to 12 years. That's not weeks, that's not months, that's hmm. years. So it is really a profound, has a profound impact on public health. We also now recognize that secondhand smoke, being surrounded by other people who smoke, increases your risk of a heart attack by 30%. Wow. And lately, a number of studies have shown that cities that promote smoking bans have a profound decrease in the number of heart attacks. And interestingly enough, it's the non-smokers who seem to benefit the most. Hmm. Is there any insight? I guess what I'm seeing is a general trend or a decline of smoking population-wide as people become more aware of it and its detriments on health. But what about vaping? I'm seeing a lot more people vaping nowadays. Do you have any data about vaping and its effects on heart health? Well, so far, the American Heart Association has not endorsed vaping as a, as a bona fide way to help stop cigarette smoking. Uh, vaping is associated with some nicotine content, depending on the product. There are also toxins that are emitted. Uh, it has been shown to be somewhat addictive, and it does cause increases, transient increases in heart rate and blood pressure. So overall, it's not something that I've jumped on and said to patients, this is a good alternative. Okay, good advice. I, I think that that makes a lot of good sense. Let's jump into another risk factor, and that would be uh, hypertension. Hypertension, in the, in the time that I've practiced medicine, which is a relatively short amount of time, I've seen the goals for hypertension change. Um, what is today's goal? What should be a healthy goal for someone's blood pressure? The latest information says the risk of cardiovascular events is markedly reduced if we can get our blood pressure under 120 over 80, and that pertains to all age ranges. So that's typically what I recommend. I used to say 140 over 90, I was wrong. There are new data to suggest 120 over 80 is really the goals that we should be establishing. Does that hold true for the elderly patient population as well? It does, but there's a fine line because you don't want to get people too, with too low a blood pressure, susceptible to falls and other kinds of problems with too low a blood pressure. That makes good sense. I, what I've often said to people, uh, especially when I'm caring for a, a geriatric population, is that there's a certain point at which it becomes a little bit more art than science in an elderly person. Is that fair to say, you think? Yeah, I, I would agree with that completely. I'd also say let's not forget about heart rate because a lot of new studies suggest lower the blood pressure, the better the prognosis, the lower the heart rate, the better the prognosis. And clinically, we have good data to suggest somewhere between 50 and 65 beats a minute is a very cardioprotective heart rate. Okay. Let's move from blood pressure into another well-known risk factor, and that would be cholesterol. So we all hear about cholesterol. There's good cholesterol. There's bad cholesterol. What should our goals for a healthy cholesterol level be? Dr. Bill Roberts, editor of American Journal of Cardiology, says that if we can get our patients under a cholesterol level of 160, there's very little evidence that there can be progression of disease. He also taught me what's called the rule of 40, and that is whatever your cholesterol is, for every 40 points you can lower it, you cut your risk of a heart attack in half. 
So if your blood, if your cholesterol is 280, take it to 240, you've cut your risk of a heart attack in half. Take it from 240 down to 200, you've cut your risk in half again. Take it from 200 to 160, you've cut your risk in half again. So lower the cholesterol, the better the prognosis. Makes sense. Deanna, I don't want to violate any patient confidentiality sort of uh, information here, but was something like cholesterol on your radar? You mentioned you didn't really have any risk factors. I didn't. I had done cholesterol testing live. I've been in my past, my journalism career spans like 25 years, and 20 of them has been as a television reporter. And I've gotten my cholesterol tested. I have had high cholesterol in the past, took medicine, then would get it normal, and then sometimes went off the medicine, Mm -hmm. which is not good advice. <laughs> and But I had a really healthy diet and I exercised a lot. So I think that might have helped me a little bit, but it also might have been the reason that I ended up having a heart problem to begin with. Also might be some genetics. Barry, what, do you, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, you know, someone who's listening right now, how often should they be getting their cholesterol checked? I think a lot of it depends on their family history, if a premature family history of coronary artery disease, what their diet is, if they're symptomatic. Bill Roberts, editor of American Journal of Cardiology, says the number one risk factor is cholesterol. We could debate that. There's mm-hmm. no question about it. But certainly cholesterol, and more importantly, p- probably the subfractions, the bad or lousy cholesterol, and the good or helpful cholesterol, HDL and LDL, are something we should also look at. Very good. Let's move on to another risk factor that I think we're all very well aware of, and that is uh, obesity. So we have healthy weight, we have unhealthy weight. Let's talk a little bit for a second about that, Barry. What's considered a healthy weight or a healthy BMI, and what are the step-offs there? Well, the, the traditional values are somewhere between 20 and 25 is a normal body weight. Um, what's very interesting is we see a U-shaped curve in obesity, and that is very thin people, oftentimes women whose BMI is less than 18.5, tend to have very high death rates. And on the opposite end of the continuum, men with BMIs over 35 have very high death rates. So I use approaching 35, I use an arbitrary 32. If your BMI is 32 or higher, you need purposeful weight reduction. Okay, so now that we've covered the typical risk factors, let's talk about the role that uh, your parents play in all this. So we've talked about, uh, at this point, we've talked about smoking and, and blood pressure and cholesterol. Now let's talk about genes. Can we parse out just how much our genes play a role in heart disease versus our lifestyle? It's a great question, and for many years, we really didn't have the answer until two years ago when a landmark study in the New England Journal of Medicine which studied over 55,000 adults, 20 year follow up period, and they had lots of genetic information on these populations, as well as lots of lifestyle information. And what did they find? Three major findings. Number one, if you pick the wrong parents, you're twice as likely to develop coronary disease at an early age. That's bad news. Good news is, if you've got a healthy lifestyle, you can cut that increased risk in half. Who was at greatest risk? Those who picked the wrong parents and also had a lousy lifestyle. Those people were four to five times more likely to develop cardiovascular disease. And what they also found are small changes in lifestyle leaded to big reductions in coronary risk. So that really puts it, I think, all in perspective. So I hear from a lot of patients sometimes saying, well, geez, you know, my my dad's side of the family all had horrible coronary disease. My dad had a heart attack at age 50. My mom has horrible coronary disease, and there's not much I can do about it. Is that is that a reasonable approach, or is it still important to take on all those lifestyle measures? No, I think the lifestyle measures, according to that study, are critically important, not only in terms of reducing the incidence of coronary events, but people who had healthy lifestyles had a lot less calcium in their coronary arteries. Cal- calcium scores were lower. Calcium scores. Now, Deanna, I understand that calcium scoring was something that was used in in your situation to to diagnose your coronary disease. Do you want to talk about that for just a moment? Yeah, I went, as I mentioned, I went through a bunch of heart testing for a story. Again, I had no complaints of any heart problems, heart chest pain, uh, shortness of breath. And one of the tests that the doctor recommended was to get a calcium scoring test. And he said, it won't take long and you can just go take it, it'll be real fast. So I laid down on the machine and the techs, we were laughing like while I was going through the machine because they thought, oh, you exercise, you eat healthy, this'll be a breeze for you. And when I came out, the um, doctor wanted to see the scans and he looked at the scans and then he looked over at me (laughs) 
and he looked at the scans, and then he looked at me, and he said, I think you have coronary artery disease. Hmm. And I said, what? Like, how can I have coronary artery disease? He said, I think you have coronary artery disease, and you need to get a stress test. Wow. So um, I thanked him and went back to work. Wow. I was thought for sure it was probably a mistake. Sure. And, and Barry, I think we can talk a little bit about uh, the different types of testing out there. Now, my understanding about calcium scoring, and I'm not a cardiologist, but calcium scoring is a screening test that would be typically used in an asymptomatic patient to sort of risk stratify you in terms of what your coronary risk might be. So would this test be appropriate for someone like Deanna? Yeah, I, I think it's entirely appropriate. Uh, overall, we find that the literature suggests that coronary calcium scores are more prognostic and more predictive than even the, even the risk factor profile that we just talked about. So increasingly, we're looking at coronary calcium scores as a prognostic indicator. A zero score means you're fine, maybe you don't have to take all these medications. If you've got a store, score of 100 or less, that's increased risk, but if you've got a score over 400, that means you really need attention, and some people have higher scores. Now, I'm, I'm playing the listener right now, and I'm hearing coronary calcium scores, and I'm thinking, well, does this mean I need to somehow modify my dietary calcium intake? Is that going to somehow impact my cardiovascular risk? No. In a nutshell, no. Absolutely. has nothing to do no, with it. that's correct. Very good. Deanna, this test is the one that you went through. What exactly is the experience like of having that test? What does it look like? There's a big machine, <laughs> and you lay down on it, and it's a CAT scan, mm -hmm. and you just go through. It just takes a couple minutes. There's no pain. I do not like pain. There was no pain. And in a matter of maybe, I don't know, two minutes, you're done. And they can provide a lot of information. There's no, the radiation is the same as if you were in an airplane. So it's a relatively low dose of radiation. Yep. And it provided a lot of information about what was going on in my coronary arteries. And Barry, that would generate a score, as I understand it, a calcium score. And that score would correspond to a specific uh, cardiac disease risk. Is that correct? Yes. In general, we say a coronary calcium score of zero indicates no subclinical disease, no early disease. Mm -hmm. Most people are probably walking around with a score less than 100, which means some evidence of subclinical disease. When you see a score over 400, there are data to suggest that the incidence of cardiac events or the need for bypass surgery or angioplasty is reasonably high over the next five years. So using those numbers can kind of gauge the next directions. It seems we have a few options here when it comes to diet, uh, to lifestyle modification. We have diet, we have exercise, and we have medications. So as far as tackling the heart-healthy diet, I'm really curious what uh, Dr. Franklin has to say about this. I know that this is something that has evolved nonstop over the last several years. It seems like our recommendations of what's considered heart-healthy versus not healthy changes all the time. So what is the science telling us as of today? I'm going to give you my Franklin's crash course, and that is I adhere to the American Heart Association, which is six to eight servings of fruits and veggies every day. I tell the patients I see, don't leave the breakfast table. Get out of the gate with at least two or three servings of fruits or veggies. Don't wait till the end of the day. Mm. Number two, more fish, chicken, and turkey. Uh, take the skin off the turkey. Take the skin off the chicken. Eat a low-salt diet, a great rule for people to remember is look at the calories per serving and then look at the milligrams of salt. A good food has about the same number. I had cereal the other day, calories 130, milligrams of salt 135. I said whoever designed this cereal knew what they were doing. <laughs> A bad food is many conventional soups. 100 calories, then you look at the milligrams of salt, 770 milligrams, almost eight times the amount. That's, that's bad. Uh, also, be aware of trans fat. Trans fats are the worst kinds of fats that are found in many bakery goods. And the problem with that is the U.S. government, the Food and Drug Administration, allows manufacturers to put zero trans fats if, as long as it contains less than five grams per serving. Hmm. I study this stuff for a living. There's a lot of foods with, ironically, 0.41 to 0.49 grams of trans fats so the manufacturer can put zero trans fats. It's wow. misleading. I had no idea about that. That's mm -hmm. really interesting. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are trans fats out there. All this no trans fat campaign is often, a bit misleading. Yeah, oftentimes zero trans fats has some trans fats in it. What do I do to tell patients? Look at the ingredients and if you see the words, the magic words, hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated, there's trans fats in there. Wow, very good. Interesting stuff. 
Interesting. Um, Deanna, I want to talk about your diet for just a moment. Again, sorry not to get too personal, but I'm curious. Um, looking back at your uh, heart health history, was diet an issue for you? Were you someone who ate a pretty healthy, well-balanced diet? This... I had ate a really healthy diet. My diet hasn't changed since I had these heart problems. I ate very little red meat. I ate a lot of fruits and vegetables. I ate fish. I ate tofu. Um, my diet was good. I don't yeah. eat a lot of processed foods. So that was one thing that I really didn't look at because I did look, you know, after you have a heart event, you kind of look back at your life and think, what could I do different? What might have caused it? And that was one area that I didn't really um, find to be needing much help. So diet, doing well from a diet perspective, none of the traditional risk factors. Now let's talk about exercise. You mentioned in your opening segment, segment that you were a pretty avid exerciser. Barry, let's talk about exercise recommendations. I know that this is in your wheelhouse because you're someone who runs the cardiac rehab program here at, uh, at Beaumont. Um, so let's try to map out what a solid plan should be for exercise and physical activity. How much, how long, how often? Tell us what you know. The general rule of thumb is 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise each week or about 30 minutes a day, five days a week. That's brisk walking. You can, be, you can exercise in a shorter period, maybe 90 minutes, if you incorporate some vigorous exercise, like slow jogging. Increase lifestyle activity. Get in the habit of parking the car further away. Take the stairs when you can, instead of the elevators and escalators. All that stuff accumulates. As you get older, the scale is very misleading. We stand on the scale and we say, well, I only weigh 10 pounds more than I did when I was in my 20s. That's very, very misleading. You're carrying a lot more fat, a lot less lean tissue or muscle tissue. So I tell as you get into middle age, start doing some resistance training, lightweight training to at least maintain muscle mass. Um, very, very important. Encourage people not to engage in high intensity, vigorous, unaccustomed exercise. Hmm. The guys who go out and shovel their driveway with snow once a year, uh, if they're not exercising, are headed for trouble. They're oftentimes fatalities. I'm going to interrupt you for just a second, Barry. So this is a very on-trend thing right now, this sort of high-intensity interval training as a mechanism for cardiovascular fitness or for weight loss. Are you telling us that we should uh, discourage that type of activity for, for our patients? If you're in the military and you're <laughs> otherwise healthy and you're 18 years of age, it's a fast way to improve your fitness. If you're 50, 60, 70, and you're plagued with major risk factors, Although some studies in Europe have shown it's safe, they were medically supervised and monitored. Hmm. I don't want people going in their 50s, 60s, and 70s pushing the 90% all out all effort because it can promote plaque rupture, uh, serious heart rhythm regularities. So for all those reasons, I'm against it in middle-aged and older adults. Even if you were active in your younger years, don't go out and suddenly start running or jogging. Everybody should start by walking at a two to three mile per hour pace, gradually increase the walking speed till you're at three and a half, maybe four miles an hour. And if you stay symptom free, you can continue to progress. If you develop symptoms, stop the exercise program and get checked out by your physician. Barry, I've heard you talk uh, in, in different venues before about this concept of a reverse J-shaped curve. And when it comes to that, uh, the sweet spot of, of how frequently one should be exercising. Uh, I think data that you had presented once upon a time showed the sweet spot seems to be somewhere about two to four times a week seems to really decrease your mortality versus exercising every single day. Can you talk about that for yeah, just a moment? Yeah, the, the new mantra is exercise is medicine. If exercise is medicine, it's possible to overdose and underdose. So I oftentimes say to patients, if you had a headache, and that headache did, didn't go away, you took an aspirin, and it still didn't go away, would you think of taking eight aspirin because you want to make sure that that headache goes away? <laughs> it's the same analogy with exercise. You can mm. overdose exercise, just like you can overdose aspirin, and get yourself in trouble. Hmm. I want to get back to Deanna for just a moment. So we talked about the traditional risk factors, of which Deanna has virtually none. We talked about diet and we talked about exercise, two things that, um, that Deanna has done a very good job of. So she sort of fits into this person that doesn't have the conventional risk factors. Now, I've heard you quote data saying 
uh, that if you can make it to age 40 without any traditional risk factors or traditional cardiac risk factors, the chance of having any type of a coronary event is extremely low. So how do we explain someone like Deanna? Yeah, there, there are always exceptions to the rule. And I, I would say, in addition to risk factors, look at other factors, psychological factors, stress. Look at genetics. Was there any genetic predisposition in the family toward coronary disease? Not really. My parents had coronary problems in their 70s, mm -hmm. so it wasn't young. Stress, everybody has stress. <laughs> I have had, my job is pretty stressful. I've worked under a deadline for 20 years. Um, I've had stress in my personal life. My only child passed away when he was five. That's pretty stressful. Mm. Um, so I don't know if that gives me more stress than other people. Well, you mentioned your parents had coronary disease in their 70s. My clinical experience is oftentimes I see the kids coming in 10, 15 years earlier with the same coronary disease. Now you look like you're 25 or 30, so that couldn't apply to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> so we've covered the diet and exercise components of lifestyle modification. Now I want to talk a little bit about medications um, and some certain medications that we should be aware of. So let's talk about some of the commonly used cardioprotective med medications that are available and what their role might be um, for preventing not only the first heart attack, but also for the treatment of cardiac disease after it's discovered. What are some medications out there that, um, that we should be looking at or taking to prevent that first event? The big four, aspirin, statins, beta blockers, and ACE inhibitors. Okay. Basically, these prevent blood clots, these lower cholesterol, they reduce heart rate and blood pressure and stress on vascular walls. The literature, the scientific studies clearly show that if you take any one of those, typically the reduction in cardiac events is 18 to 44 percent. I don't know about you, but I want that 18 to 44 percent with any one of those uh, medications. So they're all very, very good. They're better together with lifestyle change, mm -hmm. the lifestyle change we were talking about, the exercise, the weight loss, and so on and so forth. But as Deanna said, and I caught this earlier in our conversation, when you said, well, I didn't always take the medications, that's a big problem in medicine. And doctors today prescribe and they assume automatically the patients are taking medications. Maybe they're too expensive, maybe there are some side effects and so on and so forth. But these medications do work. They unequivocally reduce the risk of initial and recurrent cardiac events. And we should be checking to see if patients are taking them and if they're not, why? Very good point. I want to shift gears now but from prevention to more about treatment. And I think you're going to talk about a lot of the same medications. Um, in terms of uh, the ACE, the, the beta blocker, the aspirin, and the statin. Um, but before we get into that, let's go back to something that we spoke about earlier, which is screening for heart disease. You know, Deanna, we talked about calcium scoring as one modality that's out there for, for screening. In your case, someone who's completely asymptomatic. Um, if I'm listening right now to us having this conversation, how do I know if I should get screened or not? Should I be asking my doctor? What should I be asking my doctor? My answer would be, if you have a strong genetic predisposition, if your parents in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s had cardiovascular disease, if you have an unhealthy lifestyle, as I said just earlier in this podcast, if you've got an unhealthy lifestyle and genetic predisposition, you're four to five to times more likely to develop coronary disease. If you're symptomatic, I tell patients, if you've got pain or discomfort from your belly button on up when you're walking up a hill that goes away, it could be angina. It's not always substernal, right in the center of the chest, uh, chest pain. If you've got multiple risk factors, if you've got high cholesterol or you're a cigarette smoker, those are the people I'd recommend for screening. Absolutely. And uh, what type of screening test do you think is the most appropriate screening test? Obviously, this is something that, you know, a patient's going to go to a physician and they're going to talk about this, but what's a good first step screening test for most patients? I think the first thing I would acknowledge is our ability to predict events remains imperfect. Despite all the expensive tests and everything else, sometimes you do a test, you say everything looks good, it's called a false a positive or a false negative. Uh, I think there are several good tests. Uh, an exercise treadmill test can be very helpful mm -hmm. in terms of looking at the electrocardiogram, eliciting symptoms, finding out what fitness levels are, and an echocardiogram, which looks at how well the heart's pumping and how well the valves are opening and closing, can be very, very helpful. Sometimes we can get simultaneous imaging, either with an echocardiogram or nuclear scans. So all these are potential tests that one can use. 
I still think coronary calcium scoring is very good. It's relatively inexpensive. And if you've got a zero calcium score, uh, your risk is very, very low for an acute coronary event. Deanna, anything you want to add about your journey? After you found out that you had this um, abnormal calcium score, then you were recommended to have a stress test. Talk about your experience with that. First of all, I was so floored because I didn't expect that there was anything wrong with me that well, I wasn't... And from hearing from Dr. Franklin, it sounds like that you, you may have just been that, that patient that didn't necessarily have the conventional risk factors. So absolutely. And so I thought, you know, I was even thinking that maybe I moved in the machine or maybe <laughs> I didn't hold my breath long enough when they said to hold your breath. So I really wasn't that concerned, but... Luckily, I have a sister who's pretty pushy, and every day she would ask me, did you sign up for your stress test yet? Did you sign up? And I hadn't, and then I went, finally, I had her set me up with an appointment with a cardiologist that she knew, and I went and saw him, and he recommended a stress echo test. Mm -hmm. And so I got that, and again, I was so not concerned. I was playing tennis the night before. I went and had the test done, the test was easy for me. I stayed on, I think, 10 minutes. I had no shortness of breath or chest pain. They told me to get off. I thought I passed. I was texting friends saying that I knocked it out of the park <laughs> and that there wouldn't be a problem. And then the next day, I got a call from the doctor, and he said, you know, your EKG is abnormal when you exercise. Wow. And right away, I started thinking back like, oh no, yesterday I was playing tennis. The other day I was doing a cycling class that was kind of freaking me out. And then I had to get a, another test, a, um, arteriogram. Hmm. So for Barry, for someone who has an abnormal stress test, the next logical test would be direct visualization of those coronary arteries. That would be a coronary angiogram or what's called a cardiac cath, correct? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so Deanna, you went through this procedure and what did they find? So I went through that. They went through my arm, mm -hmm. and it turned out that one of my arteries was 99% blocked. Wow. That basically I was wow. a walking time bomb. I could have had a massive heart attack or worse. It's incredible. And, but that wasn't enough because then they found out that there were other things wrong, and I had to go back the next week and have another cath through my groin this time, and a couple of my other arteries were massively blocked. And I ended up with four stents. Wow. So a stent would be something that would they would deploy in a, in a, in a closed-off artery to sort of reopen that artery up and, and restore blood flow to that you know, critically affected coronary artery, right? Yeah. One thing I think that people should realize, and that is a major study from the Cleveland Clinic several years ago showed that 85% of all Americans over the age of 50 already have evidence of atherosclerotic coronary disease. This is not a shock. If you grew up on Ben and & Jerry's and McDonald's and all, all, these, uh, all these products and so on and so forth, there's a good likelihood that you have developed coronary disease if you're over the age of 50. The key thing, which is what we're trying to talk about today, is how do you prevent catastrophic events, the kind that killed uh, the beloved newscaster, Tim Russert, or the fine actor James Gandolfini in their 50s. Mm -hmm. Those are the kinds of things that hopefully this will be of help, uh, this information will be of help to, to your listeners. Excellent point, excellent point, Barry. Now, Deanna, I, I understand you know Barry Franklin. You uh, participated in this cardiac rehabilitation program. I guess this is an opportunity I want to give Barry to talk a little, or both of you actually, to talk a little bit about what the cardiac rehabilitation program is and, and why it's good for patients in your type of situation. Well, first of all, I didn't even know about cardiac rehab. Mm -hmm. And after you have something wrong with your heart, you pause and you. You're, my biggest concern was, when well, am I going to get back to my normal life? Like, am I going to be able to exercise again? What am I going to be able to do? And I was very fortunate that my doctor recommended cardiac rehab because I've done stories where half the people that have a cardiac event are not sent to cardiac rehab. And if you're a woman, it's even less. Mm -hmm. So I didn't even know about it. And then I went to car I went to cardiac rehab and I remember walking in my first day and I was a little nervous and a little out of sorts because I was seeing all these people hooked up to EKGs and they're getting their blood pressure tested. And I felt like my heart kind of let me down and I was a little worried to 
try to work it much, but with each visit with Dr. Franklin and his team, you start to gain more confidence and you realize that you know what you can do and what you can't do, and pretty soon I was back to full speed. I think an important message I tell all patients is take responsibility. 